flow where I was talking about something like this. Like you pull up a customer's house after giving them this discount, you're all scared and your life sucks and they're living in this big house and their life is great. And like you're trying to give them a deal and like you, you like them and you pull up at their house next week and they're like having a $50,000, a $50,000 patio installed with like a fire pit and a jacuzzi. And you're like, how much did that cost? And you're sitting there raking their leaves and they're like, oh, $85,000. Well, it was 50, but I had to get the jacuzzi. <laughs> I had to get the jacuzzi. He's sitting there like with a scarf around his neck, smoking a cigar and you're out there freezing. <laughs> and then you, and then you're like, oh my God, oh my God. And then you show up the next week, right? And there's like a brand new BMW in the driveway. Oh my God, there must be company over from Boston. They have company from Boston, but it's not company from Boston. They bought their 16 year old son a BMW. They got a deal on it. Oh, it was a year old. Yeah. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. your first car was a rusty mountain bike from Walmart. Yeah, that was your first car. Or it was like my first, you know what my first car was? My first car got stolen. Dude, I've had like, oh, this is a totally different video. <laughs> Dude, I've had 26 cars. My first car I never got. My second car was my first car. And that was a car that the motor blew up on me the first time I drove it. Then the next car I got, the transmission blew up on me. Then the next car I got, the transmission blew up on me. Then the next car I got, it was falling apart and I had to sell it. And then I bought another car, the motor blew up on that. I bought another car, the motor blew up on that. Then I bought another car. That one I sold and got another car that got in a car accident and got smashed. And then I had another car that, so basically my life was a series of cars. Every time I worked my guts out and barely saved up just enough money to get a car, the thing blew up on me and then I was walking and riding a bike to work cutting grass for 10 bucks an hour for another like seven months straight to barely save up to get another car. So that car would break down on me. And you know what people said to me? This is like they probably say to you, well, why do you keep buying those piece of crap cars then, man? I see beautiful brand new cars all the time for like 16 grand. You could have got that, that, look at that car. It's only two years old. It works great. It works great. It's only like 16 grand. I bought myself one. I even bought one for my son. Why do you, why do you keep buying? I was in court one time. I had gotten pulled over so many times in this Dodge Shadow, if you know what that is. This car had an oak tree, fell on it. It was smashed. And then it got in a car accident, veered off into another, before I owned it, right? And hit another car. This car looked like, like, <laughs> it looked like a crushed soda can going down the road with like the taillights falling off, squeaking. It was horrible, man, it was horrible. And I was driving around this thing. It was horrible. And the whole windshield was cracked and broken. The thing was, it, it was, the, it looked like a crushed sardine can <laughs> driving down the road. Do you know what it feels like to always have the biggest piece of crap on the road? Man, I'm totally digressing off the point of this video, but this is how you grow a spine, because you get so sick of living this way. I always had the biggest piece of crap on the road. I got used to it. I start to laugh and get prideful, but look at my truck. It has rust all over it, and it's puttering down the road. I'm terrified it's gonna break down, while all these people are brand new F-150s and Cadillacs are just flying past me, honking in the horn. So I'm in court one time. I got another ticket for like violations, broken headlights and taillights and windshields. I couldn't afford to fix it a long time ago. You know what the judge said to me? I said, off, I said, Mr. Your Honor, I'm broke. I work a crappy job and I'm trying to save up to get a new car. <laughs> the judge said to me, he goes, why don't you keep your piece of crap off the road then? Full ticket. Next. Why don't you keep your piece of crap off the road then? Nothing against the judge or 
anybody in a position like that, right? I'm just saying people in general, nobody cares about what you're going through. Nobody cares about your struggle, your hard time, your strife. If you have family members that have sicknesses or illnesses, I don't mean to be mean or anything. What I'm saying is like, nobody cares about your problem from your perception. So if you see yourself as a victim in anything, including your business, no matter how freaking hard it is or what type of industry you're in, whatever you do or how much saturation or cutthroat it is, it's in every business and it doesn't matter how you feel about it if, it, if you're thinking about it as a victim, it's never, ever, ever, ever gonna get better, anything in your life, if you consider yourself a victim. So, you wake up in the morning, something has changed, and a straight up stone cold vengeant lion comes out of you. I did have a client that was a billionaire, and he said something interesting to me. He said, I'll tell the story, I can't say who it is. I need a piece of Kleenex, because my nose is running. One second. Okay. Okay. This uh, client of mine was whew, probably the most alpha, male I've ever met in my life. Just when you talk to him, the way he looked in your eyes, it was riveting, okay? This dude, when he spoke, stuff happened. <laughs> and he was awesome. Um, he said that his father had owned restaurants when he was young. And something happened where he uh, temporarily had to take over one of his father's restaurants. And because his father wasn't there, the employees were just like jerking around and not doing their jobs and everything was kind of going to hell in a handbasket and nothing was working in the restaurant and now he was this young, young man taking over running an entire restaurant. This was his, you know, break, break in of, of, of entrepreneurship. And this is how he grew a backbone. He knew that his father wasn't there and there was nothing. The, the business was literally going to go under and it was going to be his fault, even though he was young. And he had to do something about it immediately. He went in the back door of the restaurant and saw the cooks and the dishwashers and everybody standing around talking and smoking cigarettes. And, and, and there was tables to be taken care of and stuff that needed to be done. And they had been doing this incessantly. He said something had snapped inside of him he took something and he smashed it down on the ground or broke a plate or, or smashed or pounded his fist. I don't know what he did, but it was like violent and, and shocking in a very demanding way. Um, and I don't mean violent in a negative way. I just mean like grabbing attention. And he, said, and he pointed at all of them, even though he was younger than them, he pointed at all of them and he started um, yelling and cussing at them um, in a way that, saying that their asses would be fired if they didn't get to work immediately and do their jobs. And he said that when he said that, they all could feel that he was serious and they were scared and they all got back to work immediately and none of them had ever disrespected him or the restaurant ever again. And he looked in my eyes and he said, because um, this is a point where I was working on his property and he could see that I was letting my employees walk all over me. They weren't working effectively and you know, the way that he saw fit on the property. This was a client that I had for several years, right? And it got to the point where if you got a client who's a billionaire who wants to give you words of advice, you're probably gonna wanna listen, right? And I opened that door to allow that in because I really appreciated the advice. It's kind of embarrassing. You know, but he said, when they look in your eyes, they have to be, they have to see that you're willing to lose everything. Like that you're partly nuts, you don't care. When they can see that you're willing to lose everything, then they'll take you seriously. And that's where the shift happens. That's when things start going your way. 
That's when the same clients come back to you who didn't respect you and now they're paying you way more. That's when new people are paying you more. That's when you're getting paid more what you're worth. It's just the shift in your consciousness. It's when you get out of your head and you get into your body and now you're no longer the prey, you're the predator. You're no longer the hunted, you're the hunter. You're no longer the rabbit, you're the fucking werewolf. You're running through the woods and you stop. And you turn around And now you face what you're afraid of. And then you realize it's an illusion. You have a misidentification. It's very easy in the first few years of your small business to get so caught up in running and survival that you you won't even you'll keep making the same stupid mistakes over and over and over like underquoting stuff, underbidding materials, working whole jobs for free, just doing stupid crap over and over and over and you, and you become like in this reactive state where you can't stop it and you feel like you're like strapped to the front of a speeding freight train that's like <laughs> and you and there's so much is happening at once that you, you can't do anything but barely just hold on to this thing and just go through the motions and just do what you can and then you get exhausted and depressed you get into a place where you can't think clearly and you know if you just work your ass off 11.5 hours a day six days a week and you just keep doing that, that you'll barely make it. And, you know, at some point, you keep, there's no big red stop button where you can stop life and get off this thing and look at it. And that's where having friends that care about you, that are entrepreneurs, that are successful, instead of looking at them and getting upset now, you put your, your fucking pride and your ego to the side and say, hey man, my shit isn't working like your shit is working. I need some help and I don't need anything from you. I just need some guidance. And that's when you you start making changes. You gotta get your pride out of the way and your ego out of the way first and accept that you're not a failure, you're not a loser. You're just a small business owner. You're not special. You're going through the same thing everybody else has gone through. They've gone through it too. And I think that what makes the difference is speed of implementation. They figured out how to face their weak spots faster and their own blindness is faster. I have them. I have plenty of them, dude. I think that my blossoming and my growth is way slower than I thought it would be. Right? I thought my business, I thought I would have like 10 crews by now and I'd be like, have this whole business on autopilot and then the real world sets in. You know? So when your reality doesn't match your expectations, that's where you become stressed and you get anxiety, right? But then the reciprocal, when you're actually winning and you're making good money and things are working and you're controlling your business and you're taking responsibility and you control what happens. You set up a radius in how you work. I mean a radius in, in the your service area. This is my new service area. I don't work outside of that. If I do, there's going to be an extra price, a travel cost that you just build into the quote. You don't put like travel cost. You just like... Add it to the quote. Instead of 400, it's 500. Instead of 30, it's 50. Whatever that is. And if the customer says, no, okay, I can't do it. If you don't have any work, then get good at marketing and advertising and open up a separate bank account. Marketing and advertising. Put 5% of all your gross revenue in there and spend it. Now you're gonna be blowing money on marketing and advertising because you don't even know if what you're doing is even working. Why? Because you don't even understand how to do marketing and advertising. You don't even know how to make stuff convert. Now you wake up even again, you're like, oh my God. The more you learn is the more you learn that you don't know. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on until you realize you're a little speck inside of a big universe and you can't out evolve yourself. And the more successful you become is the more successful people that you attract around you and you get into higher circles and you're always a small fish in a big pond and you don't even realize how successful you become until like you become way more successful. You've quadrupled the success of when you first started 
but you don't even see it because you constantly feel like a loser. You're like a millionaire loser. You're like a millionaire, but your friends are all billionaires. You're like, I'm a loser. You're living in like a half a million dollar house, right? You've got like a drop top Corvette, but they've got Ferraris. You're like, <laughs> Like you could really end up like that with cr totally crazy and psychotic and stressed out and neurotic because you have this huge misidentification of the ego because you're living in lack and you could actually literally end up a millionaire who's totally broke inside and depressed who end up, ends up like hooked on like antidepressants or something, right? And your marriage and your life is falling apart because you don't realize the true value and worth inside. The equanimity that you live in pure equity with everything that is. That there's way more levels and lines of success than just money. Like it'll get to a point where everything that is material, the material world is something that's constantly evading you. It, it's always evolving right in front of you like this. So the more you chase it and the more you acquire is the more it keeps revealing itself into infinity. It's the trap. It's, a, it's the spirit of mammon. Look it up, the spirit of mammon. So, you know, I think that if you define boxes, like stages or however you see it, I'm a visual person. You say, you know what, dude? I am successful. I am wealthy. I'm healthy. I'm wise. I'll end it with this. The healthy person has a crown on their head that only the sick person can see. There's nothing worse than being sick in bed or sick in a hospital bed or something like that and you're completely exhausted and out of options. Wishing that you could go out and rake leaves for somebody or cut a lawn or clean a window or chop down a tree or build a deck or whatever, dude. Just to have the health to get up and go to work and be able to just be alive and to breathe. It is real wealth, especially living in this country. You're sitting here right now, if you're still watching this, I want you to say one word in the comments, one word. I want you to say, what up though? No, no, I gotta tell you how to spell it. W-A-D-U-P, what up do, D-O, but you gotta put an exclamation point at the end of it. What up do, and then I'll know, and I'll know that, that, hey. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs>